Nothing positive happens until we make that decision. Nothing. I got it. We welcome our visitors. I see faces that I have not seen before. You came on the right Sabbath. We have a potluck today. Yes. Stay after church service. Join us. Let us uh, have the opportunity to get acquainted with you. Find out where you're from. Have thine own way, Lord. Amen. This quarter we're studying the book of Galatians. And today we're studying the second half of Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. For those that have been here before, we are studying the book of Galatians, the way that God inspired Paul to record it. Word for word. And so we're taking two Sabbaths for each chapter. Today we finish chapter 4. So let's begin by finding volunteers that would like to read for us the subheading, the subheading between verse 20 and 21 in Galatians chapter 4. The subheading. Two covenants. Two covenants. Anyone else has a, another subheading? The subheading for Galatians chapter 4 between verses 20 and 21. Two covenants? Anyone else? Bond and free. That's what mine says. Bond and free. What does the word bond mean? I'm not talking about buying a bond. I'm talking about bondage. What does that mean? Slavery. Huh? Slavery. Slavery. Yes. Yes. What does the word covenant mean? An agreement? A promise? What else? Legally, it's a contract. It also is used when... when well, we should do it early in our lives. We should make a will so that all of our possessions are distributed when we pass away to those whom we want our possessions to be distributed. That's called a will. So legally, the word covenant can also be used as a will. We concluded last week's lesson with verses 16 and 19 of Galatians chapter 4, where Paul says to the Galatians in verse 16, just because I'm writing these things to you, that does not mean that I have become your enemy. It's because I love you. Then in verse 19 he says, In fact, I not, the reason I love you is because you have become my spiritual children. And that's why I'm going to stay in your face until Christ is formed in you. That's the last part of Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Until Christ is what? Formed. Isn't that the purpose of the gospel, folks? Amen. For Christ to be formed where? In us. Aren't you tired of good advice? The world is waiting to see whether the gospel works or not. They're tired of good advice. They're tired of sermonizing. They're tired of people telling them, you should do this, you ought to do this, and you must do this, or you're going to burn in hell. They're tired of it. They want to see the evidence, a live evidence of a human being with a pulse that's what? Allowing Christ to be formed where? And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. Preach the gospel as a what? As a Bible study? As a DVD? As a piece of literature? No. As a witness. The word witness is a legal term that describes someone that has seen something and it's changed their life. 
has changed their life. And the evidence, or if you prefer, the witness, is what? Christ being formed in them. Also, it means Christ being formed in the church as a body, as a witness. That is going to be awesome. Correct. That's the ultimate <laughs> finished product. That's when the latter rain can be poured out. Amen. Revelation 18, 1 through 4. I'm going to use bad grammar here to get your attention. But that ain't going to happen until what? I permit Christ to be formed where? In me. In me. Do we understand this? Do we understand the significance of this? It has to begin with me. Or there is going to be no ladder in. Okay. Let's begin our study this morning of Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Who would like to volunteer to read Galatians chapter 4, verse 21? Volunteer. Thank you, Diane. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not fear the law? What a question. What a question. Why would Paul ask such a question? Does that question apply to me? I know this was written 2,000 years ago, but we're here to find out what? What is the object lesson here? What do I, what, if, what does God want for me to experience so that Jesus can be formed in me? I, I, when I read that, I just, I mean, I've read it before, but I said, but this is it. This is it right here. Tell me, why do you prefer to be under the condemnation of the law? Do you really, are you really listening to what the law is saying? Please explain to me, why do you prefer remaining as a what? Remember what we said last week in Galatians 4 verse 3? Turn to your left, make a left turn, and look at verse 3 of Galatians 4. So also we, while we were what? Children were held under bondage, under the elemental things of the world. When I looked at verse 21, it reminded me of what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes to Corinthians, his first letter, 1 Corinthians, three years after he had visited them. <coughs> And he says to them in verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, the reason I'm writing you is because Clo, one of the members of the Corinthian church, tells me that there's a lot of fighting and bickering among you. The reason I'm writing you this letter is because three years ago, when I first visited you, I didn't give you solid food because you were babes, spiritual babes. So I fed you milk. But three years later, I hear from Chloe that you're acting like mere men. Heathens. How many of you are parents? I'm a parent. And when people come used to come to visit us when we just, the baby had just been born, and the children needed their diapers changed, I volunteered. <laughs> I volunteered to change my children's diapers when we had visitors, and when they were no visitors also. Now in those days, we were making the transition between diapers where you use safety pins and pampers. I'm 
amazing myself, big of myself. And I remember one time, someone asked me, well, Chuck, how's parenthood? It just so happened that one of my children needed their diapers changed. And I said, come over, let me show you. And I took great pride in changing my child's diaper. And the people were saying, oh, really, you shouldn't have asked that question. Without poking the child with a safety pin. Now, for the sake of connecting this with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, let's suppose that these people come and visit my children when they are 5 or 10 years old. And we're sitting at the table, and one of my children says, Daddy, I need my diapers changed. Uh, would I invite my vi visitors to open the bathroom to watch me change them? What's the problem here? My children refuse to be potty trained. What Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 is, when are you people going to grow up? Does that question, uh, uh, is it fair to ask that question of us today? You decide that. But that's the question here. Why do you people prefer to live under the condemnation of the law? I preach the gospel to you. You even were able to visually see Jesus crucified through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now you're turning to the bondage of the law. Please explain to me what is going through your head. Who would like to read verses 22 through 27 of Galatians 4 to begin our study? To get into the answer to the question that Paul is asking in verse 22. Tell me, why do you prefer to live under the bondage of the law? Please tell me. Explain it to me. Who would like to volunteer to read verses 22 through 27? Let's, uh, would you mind standing up and turning around so that everyone can hear you, Patty? Am I putting you on the spot? Yeah, you are. <laughs> it wasn't my intention. So. Okay. Everyone follow, beginning with verse 22 through 27. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Abra, Abra, Abra. The correspondence to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Thank you. As an allegory, Hagar represents Mount Sinai, bearing children to what spiritual condition? Context of this of this whole discussion is actually in Galatians 2, verse 16, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, which is the Mount Sinai experience, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh ever ever, in all of eternity, be justified. Thank That's you. the point. Thank you, Raymond. When God says something once, is that important? Yes. But he just read in verse 16, Paul is saying the same thing five times in half of a verse. He says the same thing in the positive twice, and in the negative three times. Then we're not justified by what? works. So my question is, what does Hagar, <coughs> represented by Mount Sinai, 
What spiritual condition does Hagar in Mount Sinai reflect? All that the Lord says we will do. Doing it by works in their own way. Self-righteousness. All of your responses are correct. The word that I have down is slavery. Why would this be so? Wasn't Abraham the one that God gave the promise to in Genesis 15, 6? Yes. Wouldn't that make Ishmael just half a slave? Since his mother was Egyptian? <laughs> Just as Hagar can only bear children to slavery, even God's law, spoken from Sinai, cannot beget free men and women. <laughs> Why can't the law free us? Romans 3.20, please. 
Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, there you have it. What does the law do to me? It identifies It's a knowledge of what? Sin. What I look like. Yeah. I am sin. And the law says, this is how you look, Chuck. And that's all it says to me. It makes me knowledgeable about how I look in comparison to how who looks? Jesus. Are we absolutely, do we understand what she just read for us? Okay. Romans 4, 14 and 15, please. For if they were, for they which are of the law be heirs, and faith is made void, and the promise is none of them. Because the law worketh wrath, for no law is, there is no transgression. The law worketh what? Wrath. What is wrath? Bondage. Bondage. Back to the question in verse 21. Tell me, Galatians. Why do you choose to be under the condemnation of the law? Why do you choose to remain in bondage? Please explain that to me. God is still asking that question today. Amen. Is there an object lesson there for me? Yes. Mary Jane. They're trying to clean up their own act instead of letting God do His work. Why do you think that's so? In my case, it's because that's I was taught that. I was told that I had to clean up my act. Now maybe you didn't experience that, but that's been my experience. And I've lived a frustrating Christian life most of my life until I began to study what I call God's version of the gospel. Found where? Do you have one of these things? <laughs> The difference between studying this now and before is that I began looking up certain words in the Bible. Find out what the words mean. How many of you believe this is inspired? I agree. But unless we study it the way that God inspired it to be studied, you're not going to get it. I didn't get it. Then I began studying Seventh-day Adventist history. Woo! Wee! Was that an eye opener? God has only raised, according to Scripture, only two churches in 6,000 years of recorded history. The first one was Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. When God said to Israel, I'm going to fulfill in you the promise that I made to, guess who? Abraham. Abraham. 430 years after you've been what? Slaves in Egypt. I'm going to fulfill my promise to him in you. Today, we are impressed by numbers and visual appearance. And so God says, I picked you because you were the most sorry looking people that anyone would pick to raise a church through. In those days, power was measured by numbers, artillery, manpower, etc., etc., etc. And Israel was what? Nothing. They came out of Egypt with their clothes on. That was it. God says to them, you're it. I'm going to make you something very special. We're going to study about that this morning. Because that's what these two mountains and these two women represent. Then, I believe, he raised his church with a specific mandate. And that was to restore God's version of the gospel, experience it, and only then proclaim it to the world. In that order. And once you begin studying Seventh-day Adventist history, you'll see that God's mandate is very, very clear. And he hasn't changed it. He has not changed it. So, uh, Raymond. Yes, the three angels' messages is the gospel in the end kind of setting. Yes. That's what it is. 
Yes, most there it is. Yes, relevant. That's right. So at Sinai, what did the people promise God? In Exodus 19:8, all that the Lord has said. You know what the word "do" means in Hebrew? Accomplish. We will accomplish this. We will accomplish. It's a done deal, God. We will accomplish. They were promising God to make themselves righteous through their own works, which was a failure then, and it's still a failure today, anyone that tries it. So even though it was God who spoke the Ten Commandments at Sinai, that made no change in the conditions, scripturally, in keeping the law. Made no change whatsoever. Even though God spoke the Ten Commandments, it made no change in the conditions of how we experience the Ten Commandments in our lives. If a man is in prison for a crime, how does he gain his release? Let me give you one option. They have a program to rehabilitate people in prison, and that is to listen to the law through the speaker system during the waking hours of each day. Will that release and qualify this man for release? Hearing the law over and over and over and over, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Will that qualify him to be released? Hearing the sound of the law, do's and don'ts, only frustrated me. Because the more I heard it, the more I tried to perform it. And the more I tried to perform it, the more I fell flat on my face. I don't know if you've had that experience, but that has been my experience in trying to be good so that I can say it. So, does that mean that God led Israel into bondage? God did not induce them to make those promises to him, did they? In fact, the author of the book Patriarchs and Prophets says in page 372, line 8, it was their covenant. They making a deal with God instead of they accepting God's promise to them. Is there just a little bit of a difference there? Abraham never made a promise. All the other did is say, Amen. I agree. Four hundred and thirty years before Sinai, God made a covenant with Abraham, which we read about three weeks ago. It's recorded in Genesis 12, <laughs> 2 and 3. And God made seven promises to Abraham. Those seven promises to Abraham are sufficient back then to Abraham and sufficient for us today. God established, that's a key word, God established his promise to Abraham. We use the word established today grammatically wrong. So, let's go to our Bibles right now and we're going to look up 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read it to you. If I ask someone to read it, I'm going to have to interrupt because of key words here. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1. 
chapter 1. Let me know when you're there. And I'm going to read to you verses 18 through 22. Are we ready? Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. But as God is faithful, what song did we sing this one morning? 100. Great is what? Great is thy faithfulness. I love that song. I know it. I remember. 